Hey, uh, how's my volume? Decent? Yeah. 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 Okay. So thanks, David. Like David said, I uh, lived in Chicago suburbs for 28 years and uh, was an Illinois librarian when there were things like uh, budgets in Illinois libraries and library systems. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've since moved to Portland, Oregon, and uh, that's where I'm based now, but it's nice to come back home to see my family and to be here. I'm going to talk a little bit about design today, and I want to convince all of you that you are designers. And this design is about more than just choosing pretty colors, as the word for this uh, talk says. Um, and this design is about solving problems. So let's talk about some problems in libraries first. And here's a portion of the presentation where I'm definitely critical of libraries and a little bit on the negative side. Uh, but it's only because <laughs> I love libraries and think libraries could be and should be the most important things in our communities. So we've got some small scale problems to talk about and some pretty big problems to talk about. So the first small scale problems I want to talk about, um, we can consider interaction design problems. So I think the way that we have our services arranged, our buildings arranged, et cetera, um, it's problematic in some cases. So what do I mean by interaction design? Here's one form of interaction design in libraries. Luckily, we moved on a little bit beyond this, but this is a certain arrangement that the library had made um, to present the information in a certain way. There's another form of interaction design, right? Our catalogs. Our websites, some problematic interaction design. Shows this one kind of at random. Kind of looks like it's from 1994, but it's brand new. I conceive of library websites pretty much as a spice cabinet in the library kitchen, by the way. So it might be a bit disorganized. Not really sure how stuff got there. Don't know if it's any good or not. Is it fresh? Who knows? There's not really a plan to get more. Does anyone actually use this stuff? I don't know. So, we need to do something like that. And I'll come back to uh, signage in libraries uh, a few times during this presentation. So I saw this in the library, and the doorknob needs a sign. It's probably broken. <laughs> so this is one of my favorite examples, and uh, I'll definitely look at this um, a few times. And there's a lot wrong with this sign. Number one, it's totally ugly. Number two, it's really neat. And it really obeys no typographic conventions. There's grammar problems. I don't know if cell phones can eat anything. Uh, and then if we look down here in the corner, what do we see? <laughs> so what's the emphasis in, in this line of this library? This is a library and yelling at you. This is a library being a mom um, in a bad way, not a good way. Um, so this general attitude, this general lack of concern about um, aesthetics, even though design is about more than aesthetics. Um, so there's just a lot of things wrong with this sign. And we have, um, by the way, about 45 minutes or so, we'll have some time for questions at the end, but if anything comes up, just yell it out or raise your hand. Sounds good? All right. Okay, another form of interaction design. <coughs> Cookery. <laughs> this uh, label was on the shelves at the library where I was a director outside of Portland, Oregon, and I immediately removed it. Uh, luckily, though, um, the term has changed, right? We have a usability of victory, and now there's no longer cookery in the Library of Congress, Southern Heavens. Well, are you rolling your eyes? Are you sad about that? No. Okay, well, the point is, uh, how many people uh, are interested in cookery? No one, right? Everyone's interested in cooking or making a good meal. Um, this is a more user-centered language. You want to take umbrage with that? No, no, it should match the camera. Oh, yeah, right, right, okay. So, no. And uh, anyone from the MLS library here? Okay, Swan's still alive and here, right? <laughs> Uh, I did a search for John Steinbeck. What came up? Pretty much nothing. This is a problem. And our databases that state libraries and other organizations spend millions and millions of dollars on, and get, they get very little usage, all things considered, from library patrons. Why? I believe because they're very difficult to use. One of my main mantras is 
patrons should not have to see the word Boolean. <laughs> they don't care. They don't know. This is great for us. We're into it. We can use it. But um, this is a bit problematic for patrons. Interaction design um, can manifest itself in our physical buildings as well. So all these touch points matter. Here's a big fortress on a reference desk with a seemingly random PC is placed there for no reason. <laughs> There's another one, can't see it too well. Again, same idea, kind of a big desk. This one's lower, which might be nicer. But still, it's putting a barrier in between librarians and patrons, and I have a problem with this. So this one you might think is a bit nifty. This is uh, from the Ballard branch of the Seattle Public Library. It's got like a neat looking modern uh, E3 production chair there, and it's a smaller desk, which is definitely good. But check this out, I'm a patron. I'm sitting down here, the librarian's towering over me. <laughs> what kind of message is this sending to our library patrons? So this is not a collaborative process necessarily at this desk. This is a this is a more of a one-way transmission of information. And our reference desks look pretty much the same as they did in 1900, right? Is this a problem? Is this a problem? <coughs> okay. What can people do with our computers? We think we know what's best in some cases. <laughs> Magic school bus, totally cool. Actually, doing some round, some clapping. <laughs> no babies in the library. <laughs> Actual babies or emotional babies. Okay, I'll be honest. I I made the sign up. It's not for your library. But the point is, the point is, babies can be loud and annoying, right? Yeah. We wouldn't ban them from the library. Cell phones can be loud and annoying, but we still try to ban them from libraries. And I think that there's a lot more people do with their devices and phones than act loud and annoying, right? They send text messages, they have Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so banning a technology is kind of short-sighted. We need to be thinking about behaviors and, and creating zones for behaviors rather than banning babies or cell phones. So all of this, all this interaction design stuff has to do with usability. And libraries need to make sure that their services uh, have a balance of this magic triangle. Libraries need to be useful, they need to be desirable to use, and they need to be usable. So this is something to think about. So interaction design and our problems with it make libraries less usable. We could make our libraries more usable, and that would be great, and we need to do that. But there's still some, some bigger problems. We need to talk about what problems libraries solve and how they are useful to our communities. So these are the big, big picture issues, right? What are we doing here? Libraries in the past have improved people's lives by providing access to information for access-based institutions. First, it was books, then we moved on to digital information, and uh, this is primarily what we have done and I believe what we're doing right now. You could say, error and error, but wait, we've always done stuff like story time, that's great, and, um, what about what about the programs we do for kids and adults alike? And I think that's true. Libraries do do um, some libraries do a decent job of programming and providing this kind of social interaction. Um, but I still think that largely we are access-based institutions, <coughs> and um, this is a problem that is getting solved in other ways. And and uh, basically, here's my point: If you went to your library administrators or your town officials. What would you have an easier time convincing them of? That the library should have a book budget or the library should have a programming budget? Libraries are associated with books, right? No matter how many times OCLC asks, asks the public, people think books. And I think this is a little bit of a problem. Because books are changing. <laughs> so here's a portion of the presentation where I'll talk about ebooks a bit. Um, and it's streaming media in general. Here's the whole Apple ecosystem. They've designed software and hardware to distribute tasks to make things easy in certain ways. 
And libraries are having a hard time competing with a setup like this. This is a web comic that came out a few years back. Why DRM doesn't work, or how to download an audiobook from the Cleveland Public Library. <laughs> this web comic artist was so frustrated, he detailed each step of how to use this library product. Step 19, give up on stupid library. <laughs> This isn't the kind of feeling that we want to create in our patrons, is it? No. Um, and libraries are having a really difficult time providing uh, this kind of content in an easy to use way. And actually, I think providing the type of content that people want. So we have the advantage that our stuff is free, kind of, right? Tax dollars and all that. Um, but I think for many, many people, something that's easy to use is going to trump something that's free. Uh, and as this digital content becomes less expensive, the cost, uh, money cost, will definitely not be as big of a deal. So in this way, we're losing a little bit of an advantage there. So what happens, though, in the future when the Amazon Kindle hardware is free? If you look at a graph of the decline in price of Kindle, it's very regular and ascending at a steady rate. And when Jeff Bezos was asked about this, he said, oh, you noticed that, didn't you? Mm -hmm. um, so there's definitely rumors and talk that hardware, Amazon wants to give it away so people will buy the content. What happens when books become free from Amazon? Right now, you can get a Kindle for $20 less than um, the sale price if you agree to have ads on it. And actually, that's a little bit backwards. The default Kindle now is, what, $79 or something, has ads on it. You can pay $20 to get those ads removed. Um, will that happen with books? Amazon's doing a lot with uh, publishing. They're, they're starting their own publishing house. Will books be super cheap, a dollar, and ad supported? It sounds kind of crummy to me, and I'd pay to have it removed. Um, but I don't think this idea is too wild and crazy. Um, it's not too dissimilar, say, from Dickens publishing his works in a serial format, right? In a commercial um, publication. So I don't think that libraries should think of, uh, should consider competing with these three big players. But if libraries would want to compete with Amazon, and Apple, and Google, and the ebook realm, what would we have to do? We'd have to provide the stuff that people want, the content. We'd have to have that. Content is totally important. We'd have to have it in a format or a package that people want. And if we did that, could we do something like this? Is this the goal for, for libraries and public libraries? Would we want to create library forks? We want to create this. <laughs> and actually, if we created this, it would probably look more like this. Uh, I don't think that this should be our end goal. Um, if we do that, this is still copying what other people are doing. And if, if, if we try to copy what Amazon and Apple and Google are doing, um, we're always going to be a step behind because we have way less resources, right? Um, this, is a, this is a false race that we think we want to be in. Um, but considering libraries in this way, thinking about libraries in this way, is still thinking about libraries in what uh, Joan Fry Williams calls the grocery store model for libraries. And uh, that really struck a chord with me. This is a place where you go, you get something, and you leave. Right? This is um, not a great plan for libraries. I like to think of it as a book mausoleum uh, model for libraries, a place where content goes to die. Um, this isn't a good future for libraries. In part because this is not sustainable. Uh, <coughs> we our circulation statistics to uh, when we try to prove the worth of uh, our libraries to our, our towns and our officials and our stakeholders. The number one thing that we like to report when they want to know is how many books we've circulated. And this is uh, really tough to wean people off of, but we have to do it. Because there's really a physical limit for how many items we can move in our buildings, right? If we're not doing more, um, it's considered bad. 
there are so many other things that libraries are doing that we need to emphasize and tell stories about. Um, and you know, this isn't sustainable for other people too. These businesses, these content providers are shuttered. Orders, blockbuster. There was even a little flap with Netflix and, and they tried to they tried to um, get rid of their physical media business, right? They split their companies and they created this thing called Quickster. And they had Netflix and Quickster and then actually people freaked out about it and they decided to backpedal. But they also were kind of trying to stop the physical media business. So our stuff is hard to use. And our our main mode of operation and our way of proving work is not sustainable. What does this mean for libraries? Is this, is this problematic? Actually, I actually don't think so. I think there's a solution. And uh, here's the more positive part of the presentation. But before we start that, any comments or questions about small issues, big picture issues, anything in between? No, I didn't say anything that upset someone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you did talk about reporting other things to our officials that oversee our budgets and things. Um, and you know, I'm aware of some of those things. What, what would you have us shift toward? Yeah, um, it's a tough one uh, because numbers in a spreadsheet are easy to make a photocopy of and, and give someone. But I think libra librarians need to up our storytelling skills and have some face time with, with um, stakeholders and tell stories about transforming people's lives. I think that is really more powerful um, than numbers in a spreadsheet. I, I, well, for instance, I uh, really connected with my work as a librarian when I helped somebody with a Consumer Reports article, as I did a lot of times in my career as a reference librarian. And I helped this guy who just had a stroke um, find some headphones to use to listen to the audiobooks so he could up his language skills. And, uh, I, I worked in the same town where I lived in Western Springs, and one day I was walking my dog, and I saw this guy wearing a headphone listening to, to his audiobook. So I thought, wow, this is great. The library helped him um, improve his life. And I think this is a small scale story, um, but I think it's stories like that that we can tell our stakeholders and, uh, and emphasize that rather than have you circulated 12 DVDs and whatever. Yeah? So you showed us bad reference desks. Are you going to show us good reference desks or no reference desks? Uh, I, I have a personal mission to abolish the reference desks in libraries, um, most libraries. I think I do have a picture of a good one later on. Um, but yeah, I, I'm a fan of small, maybe boomerang-shaped reference desks where people can work together and collaborate rather than an um, interaction like this. And. Um, you know, when you take away reference desks or have smaller reference desks, it's uh, more work for reference librarians in some cases, which I think is fine. Um, it's great for librarians to get on the stacks and wander around. <coughs> We've been talking about roving reference for so long, as long as I can remember, um, in, in libraries. Um, and some libraries are doing great job, for sure. Yeah? We talk about how you see reference departments change. I mean, I think we all know that the great big almanacs and the, the big books that they go to, we're going to see less of those and less shelf space for them. But overall, the whole package, what do you think is going to happen to reference libraries? Reference departments and public libraries. Yeah, well, I think there's a great opportunity um, for working with people on their on their um, informational and life needs. And I, yeah. Well, actually, I meant very specifically. Do you have a ballpark idea about how much the space would you like to shrink on that? Or how that space is going to be allocated? Computer lab gains 20% runs of uh, almanacs and what reference to both shrink 30%? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's an interesting question. You say computer labs shrink, or computer labs grow by 20% and uh, Collections to shrink by 20%. Were you separating the computer lab and the reference department in that? Or were you separating? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So why aren't those combined in one in one um, one kind of place? I like the model from academic libraries of uh, information commons or uh, of media commons where people are just working together and they have access to the uh, hardware and software and information sources and it's a space for collaborative um, creation. That 
the head sun, head sun, head sun, head sun, this is so loud, it bleeds out, mm -hmm. and has to be, you know, spoken to, and this and that. They're actually, they actually like having that separate from the space where, say, the entire user and the father is working their way through Barron from the Wall Street Journal. Sure. Yeah, so I think what you're talking about or what you're alluding to is the idea of zoning in libraries right. and saying right. this behavior is good here, this behavior is good here, let's find space for everyone. Okay, might be a good topic of conversation for the breakout session um, after this. Yeah? Um, as we transition to more technologically advanced items, how do we still keep that 50% of the population that's never heard of Netflix? doesn't understand what an e-reader is. Yeah, that's a really great question. So for those who didn't hear, it's uh, he said, what do we do for the people who haven't heard of Netflix, don't have the technical skills to use these devices or services, or can't afford them? Um, this is a big problem. And I'm not celebrating the fact that I think libraries have been squeezed out of the digital content world. Um, I think it's not a good thing, um, but I think it's a reality. And I think it's, um, I think it's um, a way that libraries will be deficient. I think it'll be harder and harder to um, help people with access to information issues. I mean, there's classes that we can teach, um, and there's training that we can give. As far as providing the actual access, I think um, we're gonna have a harder time with that. Okay, so the solution to all these problems, by the way, is that we're designers, whether you know it or not. <clears throat> Design, you don't need to have a black journal knife, don't worry. You don't need to have square glasses. I mean, maybe it helps. I see square glasses. Um, so how can we conceive of design? It's as simple as this. Arranging things for a purpose. Right? That's easy. That's approachable. That's nice. We can do this. And here is a quote from Charles Eames, mid-century furniture designer. The role of the designer is that of a good host anticipating the needs of their guests. It's a nice way that we can conceive of our services. Okay. Anyone know what this is? This is a prototype mouse. This is one of the first library, not library, computer mouses ever made. And my point is that everything is designed. We might not think of um, things around us being designed, but people make choices for all of this stuff. Architect or interior planner, designer made a choice for the size of the bricks that um, this wall would be, color of carpeting, etc. Um, all these choices are design design choices. We need to take them seriously. So when you say design, generally people think design. They might think of architecture, right? Designing buildings. This is the famous slash this central library of Seattle Public. People think of interior design. You think of logo design. I can't believe you guessed whatever get rid of this logo that way. This is so cool. People think of website design. Uh, here's one of my favorite design stories. I was at the grocery store, I was at the deli counter, and I got done with my order, and I put my um, stuff in the basket, and I just grabbed it, decided to pull it. And what did I find there? Can't really see it, but there's a handle. Someone had totally anticipated my needs. I am not a mean and beautiful snowflake. Many other people, many other people had done that exact same motion, grabbed in front of the basket, and they had anticipated my needs by putting a handle there. This also was designed. Here's a nice example of design in an elevator. The lobby button is pressed the most, so they made it the largest. Hey, okay, this, again, this was designed. I like to call it unintentional design, or design by default. <laughs> and I think a lot of this goes on all over the world, um, not just libraries. But uh, this was uh, definitely designed by default, right? Times New Roman is the default typeface for Microsoft Word. They didn't make the choice to capitalize each letter at the beginning of the, um, beginning of the line. And they did choose to actually make it more difficult by the center justifying it. Um, so it was unintentional and bad design. So all these things, all these different um, touch points in the world, physical buildings, customer service, we haven't mentioned customer service yet, signage, colors, even smells, etc. all these things add up to create an experience for our users. And they, they create a user experience. And we need to think about how all of our touch points in libraries add up to give our uh, patrons a certain feeling. 
Here's a good story. Here's a story about a good user experience I've had. Has anyone flown Porter Airlines out of Midway? Fantastic, small airline, Canadian based. So I flew to Toronto, and when I walked up to the ticket counter, um, everyone was dressed really well. They had huge IMAX that they were working with. I'd never seen that for an airline before. Everyone was extremely friendly. Uh, I got to the waiting area, and very nice lounge. New furniture, clean, free wireless, free drinks. Uh, the wireless network was named Mr. Porter, is the name of their little mascot. This is a nice attention to detail. I boarded the plane, the plane was new and clean. They served me a beverage in a real glass container. All the flight attendants looked like they were from 1960, pillbox hats. Their journal, or, I mean, their uh, in-flight magazine, they take themselves so seriously, was called the Journal of Porter Airlines. <laughs> and they got me to my destination on time. <laughs> all in all, a great experience for Porter Airlines. And you can see how all these different things added up. Uh, on their website, it was very easy to use to book a ticket um, on as well. All, this, all these things added up to make me pretty excited about Porter Airlines. So one thing I want to highlight about this uh, quick story is that this was about more than just interacting with the people, um, and this more about the customer, more than just about the customer service. A lot of people will conflate or confuse just uh, customer service and user experience. Um, but customer service is one portion of that that contributed to the greater whole. Um, so here's another quote from Charles Eames about um, taking your work seriously. And it's this level of seriousness and pride uh, that I think libraries could definitely benefit from. So innovation in libraries for the past bit, what has it looked like? I mean, it's looked like this. We've gone out to the tech world, mostly. And we've seen what we can fit into our way of operation. And we've tried to adopt tech stuff social web stuff, which is all very important. Um, but it's definitely, our perspective has been a reactive one. We waited for things <laughs> to happen in the larger world, and we've then adapted our way of operating to that. This always puts us a bit behind, and it never really lets us make any headway, and doesn't, mm, doesn't position us to change the world. Because of this, We've really highlighted um, tools and focused on tools over people's motivations. <coughs> and uh, much like this grocery store model of libraries is a little bit <coughs> uninteresting, uh, we need to act more like kitchens. So no one wants to use a measuring cup just for the sake of using a measuring cup. A measuring cup is just a tool, right? No one says, oh, basically like a great day to use a measuring cup. Someone says, Hey, I want to make a dessert today. I want to cook some food. I need to use this measuring cup. So how are we going to find some more natural fits for people's lives into the library world? Well, we need to examine our users. And we need to conduct some user research. And this is totally critical. Our communities are our most important collections. And we need to know more about them that all of the libraries here have a collection development plan for our um, content. But I would be surprised if very many libraries uh, have a plan for developing information about our communities. So we can do this in a few ways. I'm a huge <coughs> fan of conducting user interviews and talking to library patrons. Luckily, we have some really good skills already uh, for conducting user interviews, because it's just like conducting a reference interview. Sitting down with people, asking open-ended questions, listening, um, being non-judgmental, and um, soaking all this in. If you conduct enough user interviews, you can um, develop what's called personas. These are um, sample archetypal library patrons. Do any of you have library personas? Okay, well, this would be a great um, topic for the breakout session after this talk, we talk about developing library personas. These are fictional characters that your library can create that are based in real people's behaviors. I'll say real people's real behaviors. And 
Um, you can create composite pictures of who your users are. And anytime you are going to make a um, new service or you change your um, plans, you can see if they would relate to these folks. Um, you can also use demographics to learn about people and another form of user research, usability testing. We'll talk about that in a minute. So um, another form of user research would be um, observing people. And there's a little bit about observing people in The Art of Innovation by Tom Kelly. I recommend this book. He talks about the five steps of design thinking. Understanding, observing, visualizing, evaluating, and implementing. And I want to highlight that this is a cyclical, maybe never-ending process, not a linear thing that you do once and then you're done with. So understanding the problem, observing behaviors around that, um, maybe a better word for visualizing is prototyping, coming up with sample solutions, evaluating what the best solutions are, and then finally implementing one, and, uh, and doing it all over again. So a concrete example. <coughs> this guy was watching his wife cook some food. She was suffering from arthritis. Her hands hurt. And he asked this question, why do kitchen tools have to hurt my hand? Um, and so he and a business partner came up with some new designs. They had a bunch of prototypes. They took the best aspects of all these things. And they came up with this famous um, vegetable peeler. Anyone use this one? Okay, almost like a quarter of the room. Um, this is the OXO peeler. It's easy to use, doesn't hurt your hands, etc. Similarly, um, they do a lot of user research this company. Oh, she loves this one, right? So they watch people cooking, and they saw everyone going like this. <laughs> Trying to read how much uh, you know, water was in their measuring cup, they came up with this one, which can be viewed from up top. You don't have to crane your neck. This is uh, how observing people can come up with, uh, can help you come up with a new product or service. Okay, so I have some design lessons. <laughs> Famous quote from Henry Ford, if you read any design book, this quote is probably going to be in it. He said, if I would have asked people what they wanted, they would have said, a faster horse. <laughs> and that's not true. They didn't really care about a faster horse. They wanted to get from point A to point B faster. He came up with the brand new way to do this, right, the car, uh, instead of trying to create a faster horse. So the lesson here is that listening to people and following them are not the same things. This is why probably the main user research tool that libraries get involved with, focus groups and surveys, are not exactly um, effective or the best for this um, design thinking process. Why? Because people will say all sorts of things. And when people express their opinions, they don't always behave in the way um, that they claim they will. So observing real behaviors is more effective than listening to their opinions. Okay, another design lesson. Here we have a walking dog. It does a decent job of walking, but it's not really that great. Uh, and the only reason we're interested in this dog walking is because it's new um, or interesting or not expected. So just because something is novel um, doesn't mean it's good necessarily. So you can come up with all sorts of prototypes and all sorts of new ideas. Just because it's new doesn't mean it's going to be good. So here is the uh, New York Public Library's implementation of Biblio Commons. And they have this neat feature where you can browse um, items by book cover. Check it out. It sucks. <laughs> um, so I understand about launching things kind of in beta and getting something out there and not having to be perfect all the time. But I think we need to balance that with providing <coughs> things that um, aren't just very good. Or library, uh, library presence on Facebook. I'm not saying every library presence on Facebook is bad. Uh, when I was doing some work for the DC Public Library, they had a Facebook account for every of their 27 neighborhood libraries. And they all were ghost towns like this. Um, no action, whatever. This was something new and definitely wasn't good. Since then, they've consolidated into one main 
page and it's much more successful and it's a better strategy for them. Um, here are just two examples from libraries. Okay. So can we use this design thinking and innovation to create a future for libraries? I think so. Here are some general tips or ideas. I hate this phrase. Why? Because it still privileges more over less. It's comparing more to less. I say less is less and this is a good thing. So what do I mean? I think libraries need to do fewer things. <clears throat> um, we have limited resources, limited time, limited, limited staff, limited money. If we're spread thin, it's going to be harder to do excellent work. And if we reduce the stuff that we're doing by half, we're going to be able to devote more resources to those things. And um, this is tough because we want to, we want to serve everyone and we want to be everything to everyone. Um, but I think that's spreading us thin and we need to make some tough choices. I think user research can help us figure out what the important choices are. Um, and also like this graphic because uh, I think it would be much more effective to make half of our community ecstatic about using the library than make everyone lukewarm about the library. That's just a bunch. Okay, so some, some ideas about improving, improving interaction design. I'm going to show you a redesign of this sign. Little things can definitely improve it. Okay, number one, left justification. Definitely helps. It's much easier to read. Um, this is essentially the same. I've taken away some capital letters. I've increased the size of thank you. This is an improvement on the sign. Still not good. I've changed typeface from Times of Roman to sans serif font, which is easier to read uh, for, a, for a bigger sign. <coughs> Here I've changed it to a list format. This is the exact same message. You can grasp it uh, in a much faster time. And finally, here's changing the tone and maybe being nice, putting some library branding on it. You can see this isn't um, rocket science stuff. These are small changes that can make the sign better. If you're interested in improving the signage in your libraries, check out the non-designers design book. I always have trouble recommending it because it's the ugliest cover ever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but really, we'll, we'll give you an uh, easy approach to um, redoing signs in your libraries. And then if you really get into it, Check out Grid Systems and Graphic Design, which is by the Swiss tech architect Joseph Miller Brock, and it's totally awesome. So, uh, also to improve interaction design, just spend some time looking at people using stuff in your library. This is a quick way to do an ethnographic study. Um, okay, here's a nice, uh, nice reference test. Room range shape, small um, room for two people behind to collaborate. Um, so here's some observations I made in the library recently. There's a guy using this little setup in the way that it was intended, probably. But I saw a lot of people using a couch as a backrest and putting their laptops on the little table. So these are ways that you can observe your library to see if the way you think people are using your building, your facilities, um, is really matching the way they are doing it. Okay, I really like this idea. Uh, I just posted about it on my website. I toured some libraries in Mexico recently, and the um, Federal Library in Mexico is, uh, has a library signage program where they are designing all the um, signs in-house, centrally, distributing it across the whole country. So if you go into these libraries, they have very nice looking, consistent signage. You might say, what's the big deal about this? Well, number one, it ensures that the signs are going to be of a certain caliber, a certain quality, and that's good. Also, I think it's really neat that, um, that these signs are going to be across the whole country um, because it's kind of, uh, if people go to more than one library, they're instantly familiar with one thing about, about the library. Maybe two, right? How it's organized, like the classification system, and it's just a comforting familiarity. Again, this is a small thing, um, but it's a way to have one piece of the puzzle to add up to that greater user experience. Um, I also learned in Mexico about these, um, what they call model libraries. I think this is a fantastic um, program. So libraries that are central and that are doing good things um, are giving some additional resources to do some experimentation. 
and to learn and to try new things. And other libraries in the surrounding area come to this library to learn from their mistakes or from their successes. This is a way to distribute the cost of, or actually centralize the cost of prototyping and visualizing and trying new things. This library that has their stuff going on, um, they might be able to afford, might have the skills to come up with new programs, um, to try new things, and then uh, other libraries can then piggyback off of that. So this is absolutely essential <laughs> to improving the interaction design of your library website, is to conduct some usability testing. And all you have to do to conduct the usability test is watch people use your website. It's as easy as that. Sit down, um, have, sit someone down, someone that's not a librarian, so they don't know all of our cool jargon, and say, okay, I want to have you do a task on our website. Let's say that you want to run a marathon. Find an article that will help you train um, to uh, run a marathon. Watch them struggle with flail. Don't. Um, interrupt, let them do it, before you give it up. And with that, you can learn um, how you might be able to better connect them to those resources. Also, don't redesign your website, just design your website. So there are small changes you can make ongoing that will improve things immediately rather than spending two years and a lot of money on a big website redesign project that is super frustrating. Here's Amazon.com from 2001, about 10 years ago. Looks kind of the same, doesn't it? Yeah. Now they've just kind of upended this a little bit and they're experimenting with new design. But um, here it is from maybe 2005, and here it is from most recently. They've evolved this website. When you, when you up and change things, uh, on a website, it really confuses people. They don't know what to do anymore. They've learned often to deal with, um, the, the, let's say, the, the quirks of a website, right? And if you change those quirks, then they're confused. So here's some small changes um, that I propose to the Seattle Public Library website. Um, moving this is a small change, increasing the size of the title of the page. Taking away these pictures, which really just add noise, I think, and uh, don't add too much. I'm a fan of pictures of real library patrons and librarians on, on websites, but those weren't very effective. Uh, what's the change here? Oh, I think I just put a circle around that. And then I'm adding in that closure message up there. So you can see there's, there's some small changes that a, that a library can make progressively. Okay, one more thing about your website. Any catalogers in the room here? Okay, this is for you. <laughs> your mission is to catalog your library website. It's a huge pain sometimes, depending on how unwieldy your site is, but it can reap a lot of rewards. So you come up with uh, give each page a special ID, you record the URL, uh, and you can assess these things for each page. How accurate is this? How useful is it? Is this page being used? Is this page appropriately written for the web? All these things. If you put this into a great spreadsheet, you can then sort the pages and say, okay, these are our pages that are being used the most. These are our most popular pages that aren't appropriately written for the web. You should probably rewrite these pages immediately um, or when you get a chance. So content audit, learn more about it. Excuse me, can you yeah. go back to slides you were going to pick up the next one? Thank you. Yes, no problem. Uh, and if you're going to assess usefulness, you can, by the way, break that into two categories. You can assess whether it's useful for the library to have on the website, or it's useful for patrons to have on the website. Got it? Okay. I can make these slides available too, but it wasn't what, what does it say at the end of the message? On it says last updated. Okay, I'm getting into break time here, so I'm going to, I guess, hurry up. Fantastic idea from the Swiss Army Librarian. Um, work like a patron day. Uh, go out and 
uh, spend the day working with uh, the computers and the, and the desks, etc., that you're forcing patients to use every day. Give up your office and go work in the library. See what it's like. Use the public restrooms. Um, come up with UX partners. Uh, if there's a similar library uh, in your area, you can team up with them to assess each other's buildings, services, etc. Take some trust, uh, take some taps perhaps, but it would be really nice to have another set of eyes on your building, etc. This is a nice way to do it. Again, use this triangle as a, as a tool to think about planning services. You can conduct a signage audit. You can plot. Actually, you can use this for signs, for um, service, whatever. You can say, okay, we have some things that are kind of ugly, but they're all about some things that are super ugly and mean. <laughs> and you can have the goal to move everything into a helpful and beautiful category. Okay, so that's just a little bit about fixing the interaction design problem, the small scale issues. What about these big, big why am I here issues for libraries? So finding purpose. What problems can we solve in our communities? Um, this is a this is a radical um, version of participatory design. This library outside of Malmo, Sweden, opened its doors uh, with nothing in it, and they worked with community members and community groups to plan the entire library. What it looks like, what it does, what its purpose is, and uh, and it's really popular. You know, they have whole classes. There's a lot based based around conversation and dialogue. Um, it's pretty neat. So again, we have been providing access to information, and this is a 20th century issue. The 21st century, we need to sort out people's um, demands, and uh, rather than worrying about how to get them information. Netflix, they held a contest not to figure out how to stream movies better to people. They held a, content, a contest of how to um, better predict movies for people. This is dealing with a demand issue rather than a, than a supply issue. I feel the same thing with my own personal digital photos. I have so many of them that they seem worthless, right? I don't know what to do. I need help. Um, and then we have classic internet-enabled bunnies that um, are interact interacting with the web and this is a kind of a use case for everyday objects being connected to the web. I went to a store, saw a nice green old sweater. It had a URL. Entered the URL, showed me the farm where the sheep lived, where this uh, sweater came from. Um, this is a convergence of the online world and the visible world. A lot of data, a lot of information. Librarians can help sort out people's demand and attention through consumption assistance. This is something we've done traditionally in the past. One of our librarians uh, got an action figure, essentially, for, for helping people figure out what to, what to consume. OK, another really big thing, instead of worrying about providing content, let's create experiences around content. And anyone that has had a good one book, one community program knows what I'm talking about. It's really easy to provide a book to someone, a uh, symbol, uh, but it's a lot more um, impactful to create experiences around that. So one book, one community program that I was a part of, um, you know, we had, it was a Spanish book, so we had flamingo dancing lessons, we had tapas, including the same at the library, which I thought was pretty awesome. Travel talks, et cetera, et cetera. It was a great way to bring people together around community, rather than just giving someone a book and sending them home. So here's a library in Helsinki, Library 10, their main central library, which is based around music, and you can check out a guitar. You can also book time in the radio station that they have there. You can book time in the recording studio. This is a library with an emphasis on creation, and this is a great opportunity for libraries to make them places of creation. Here's a branch they have, which is all about actually creating businesses. And uh, I can't remember the name of this place right now, but Someone can bring a laptop, get help with it. They have resources for people to develop small businesses. It's great. Cohort <coughs> opportunity. Here's someone that is measuring the size of their coffee grounds so they can figure out the best size to brew the best um, cup of coffee. <coughs> and what are they doing with this information? They're putting it on the web, right? 
the white debt libraries get involved with harnessing information, and harnessing people's passions, with people in our communities that are passionate about all sorts of things. Why is this content in our catalogs? Um, I don't know. But um, you know, it would be great if someone did a search for coffee, not only for their books on coffee, maybe information about local cafes, but also information about this coffee enthusiast group and information that they've written and connecting people together. And um, Elaine Eiberger, who you uh, heard speak before, uh, uh, mentioned the library of Alexandria. I learned this from one of his presentations. <clears throat> Their purpose was not to circulate commercial content. This is a new one, obviously, but they have today. Um, there was no commercial content to circulate. They took scrolls from ships passing by, recorded the information down, gave the copies back to the um, ships. This is a community publisher and collector of content information. <coughs> So here's a prototype we made for the DC Public Library uh, about collecting little stories and publishing them, and aggregating them. Very easy example. Libraries can um, solve the community's problems. The Homepage Cafe, this is uh, an article from Public Libraries in 09. Um, Library of Philadelphia worked together uh, with a homeless advocacy organization to train homeless people instead of just trying to kick them out. And there's a little library, there's a cafe in the library. Now, I think they I heard you first talk this morning. Libraries need to realize that they exist in host systems. And what's good for the host system is good for the library. So library advocacy is about listening, I think, not shouting. Um, we need to be experts for our communities. And I said before about, um, I said before about not having a community information development plan, they hold it's really true, and we need to start figuring out uh, a plan of how we learn about our communities. Other organizations are getting into this local um, realm. Mm -hmm. So, um, the last few things I'm going to leave you with are this. I think we need to get off of this hamster wheel of circulating items. It's not our mission. Um, we need to promote new standards for success. We have a really big impact, um, but like I just got ahead of myself saying, we can't shout loud enough that people will hear us. I really think we need to concentrate on listening to our stakeholders, listening to our communities. If we learn what we can do to help them, we will be thriving vibrant organizations. So last little design thing. Um, here's our international universal symbol for libraries. I think it's iconic, I think it's clear. I also think it's frightening. This is someone reading by themselves. Is this really what we want to be known by? I don't think so. I think we need to consider ourselves a bit different. Here's my version of it. I don't think it's as clear or iconic, but I think it's a bit more alive and interesting. Um, we need to gather people around the content rather than just providing it. Okay, um, a little bit over. Sorry about that. I don't want to go into anyone's break. I don't know if we can take one question or save them all for the next session. I don't one know. question? Here's my contact info. Can you describe your work with the Yeah, so yeah, it's a great example. So Andrew wants to know some stuff about what I did for the Tall Sword Library in Western Springs. And um, we did a number of things there. Um, one, this was many years ago, and one thing we did that was kind of new and nifty at the time was uh, just um, the available bias messaging for all the people in our community that used uh, that. And one thing that um, I think was really great, we uh, actually got a grant, I believe, from the state library. Yes, uh -huh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. to, uh, to digitize some material, and I came down here to a class on digitization, and instead of, um, or in addition to using um, the database for um, the larger project. We just used blogging software to create um, a record. Uh, blog post was a, was a record, and all this information is easily accessible online. And one historic home was a blog post, and people in Mustard Springs were really into the town. So people that lived there, and people that used to live there, contributed back to the project, um, comments on the blog, and we were able to get all sorts of great information um, that 
we never would have been able to know about because we made this is a two-way website. Three years of Okay. What was that um, website? Well, okay, it's called, the URL was org, but I'm sorry to say it was, was taken over by the Historical Society in Western Springs, and they changed the site, so it doesn't exist anymore. <coughs> Just in time. All right, Aaron has a whole breakout session, so, um, but I have to say, I love the concept that librarians are designers. That we design experiences, that we design facilities, that we design software, that we design, and that it's a conversation. We don't design alone, but we do it in working with the community. So I think it's a fantastic message. So I want to once again thank Aaron for his comments. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we're running about 10 minutes late, but that's okay because we're going to smash into